to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Hey, Colin, welcome back to this week's episode, the part two of our interview with Major Jason Hollywood Spicer. He's got some good stories in here. Oh, yeah. Ones that really touch me, you know, and you'll hear it. Turns out we were deployed at the same time. Yeah, I was wondering about that when he said in the interview that he was there at the beginning of operations into Syria before it was ever a named operation. And that sounded Absolutely. super familiar. Oh, yep. Yep. That's us. So, yeah, we'll get into it in a little bit. But yeah, when he mentioned that, I definitely had some flashback moments. And uh, yeah, he's got some good stories and some good stuff to share and definitely bring up some good points in the second half. Yeah. And that kind of just reemphasizes the fact that the Air Force is a small place, that there's a lot of overlap between all of us, right? Yeah. Which is funny because last week we talked about how big broad and vast it is yeah it's all of that and really tiny all at the same time yeah for sure all right well let's just get right into the interview with major jason hollywood spicer part two all right thanks for the awesome rundown of the process of becoming a air battle manager you know the explanation of the schoolhouse all the training that you know, people can expect to do there, a lot of the options that are available to air battle managers. But one thing that is really important that we haven't talked about yet is why do air battle managers exist to begin with? That's a solid question. <laughs> and I want to go back to what you said earlier about things being automated by a robot. Why isn't air battle management being automated by a robot. Why hasn't that happened yet? Why do we need an officer to do the air battle management thing? Well, I would love to see a robot that could do it. That would be that would be <laughs> something else. Uh, it's such a dynamic environment, depending on what you're doing, where you're going. And there's so many mission sets that ABMs fulfill. There's not going to be like a, hey, I can create this one plug and play robot. So to give you kind of an example of some of the things that we would do, right? So when I was deployed as a senior director, so I was in charge, I was a captain at the time, I was in charge of three or four enlisted controllers or other air battle manager officer controllers who were filling that same billet downrange in CENTCOM, okay? And I was a senior director for Operation Inherent Resolve, where we covered Iraq, Syria, the Arabian Gulf, that whole chunk of airspace. And we're talking, that's almost 900,000 square miles of airspace. Yeah. And as a senior director, I was in charge of that entire chunk. So I've now got my enlisted controllers who are controlling each a portion of that airspace. And I have six large computer screens in front of me, one of which is my control like platform that I can also you know manipulate and see what's out there. I have my tanker flow over here. Who's going to go refuel with who? I have my chat windows. Chat windows are huge, probably about I think I counted it one time. It varied from day to day, but anywhere from you know 45 to 55 chat windows open at all times, constantly flashing yellow at you. I had three phones that rang off the hook, uh, and I'm actively listening to about 13 or 14 radios at any given time, and I have about 120-something tunable radios that I can roll on the fly to pick up XYZ and talk to so-and-so. And all of that is occurring 24-7, nonstop, all the time in CENTCOM. So that's a lot for one individual to handle. You need a man in the loop. And I say that because you're gonna come up against something that doesn't have defined criteria and somebody's gonna need to make that dynamic decision. Okay. I think the reason that ABMs exist is to be able to make those dynamic decisions in accordance with a priority list. Hey, I've received this piece of information. I need to process that piece of information. I need to follow my priorities to make sure that I then do the correct thing in the correct order. But if there's not a canned answer for it, like press button, get banana, I need to make a decision. 
And so they train you as an air battle manager. You need to be able to make a decision in a dynamic environment based off of your training. And, you know, hopefully it's the right decision. It's not always going to be the right decision, but yeah. what you do is going to affect lives. So it's a pretty big deal. And I, I just, the myriad of jobs that we get to do and be a part of, yeah, I don't, I would love to see the machine that could do it, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's going to be one for a very long time. And why do you think that is? I mean, with the capability that the private business world is developing right now with machine learning and artificial intelligence and the internet of things, cloud computing and all that sort of thing, why is it that if you take the collective capacity of all the machines that are connected together, why couldn't they do what you do? I'm trying to think of the best way to, to describe it. I just, I don't, at least I can't envision, so maybe that's a, you know, a limitation on myself, but I can't envision having a machine that has empathy at the same time as like being able to, like I can take into account the situation at hand that there is no canned answer for, and I can apply not only emotional intelligence to it, but I can be pretty cold and calculated at the same time. I don't feel like you get the emotional intelligence and the empathetic nature from a machine, at least not yet that is going to be able to say, I know that they're saying that's the right thing to do in accordance with my priorities, but that's not the right thing to do right now. So I'm not saying you go out and flout the regs as an ABM, but you need to be able to be that man in the loop, woman in the loop that makes the decision that there's not a canned answer for. That's really deep. <laughs> and I don't mean that in any sort of sarcastic way. I, I think what you're hitting on is something that is so frequently overlooked when we have this discussion about replacing man with machines to do some of these more complicated tasks. Yeah, we replace people you know, for the simple stuff all the time, right? You know, assembly lines, McDonald's kiosks, that kind of stuff. But in these situations where emotional intelligence, and I love that you use the word empathy, in those types of situations where that is what is required to execute the mission on behalf of the Air Force and the American people, you have to have a person there to do it. You have to have a human who has that ability. You can't program emotional intelligence and empathy. Yeah, you just can't. And that's so powerful. I love that that's where your mind went when pushed a little bit to say, why does there have to be this person there, right? Yeah, I think it's important because... If you want to get really deep, right, like that's kind of what separates humanity from, you know, other mammals that maybe don't have those same types of emotions. And why is that important? Well, because you're dealing with, you know, people's lives and, and you're dealing with, you know, very high consequences to your actions. And, you know, I've made plenty of wrong decisions in my life, and my career, in the sense that maybe it wasn't the best possible decision. But I'll tell you, like, the really neat thing is when your training kicks in and you go, you know what? I'm going to ABM this thing. I'm going to go make this decision based off of the limited information that I have, because if I don't make a decision right now, something bad is going to happen. And I know that. So maybe yeah. it's not always the best, you know, a program that has incomplete information is also going to make a decision if it has to in a certain deadline, but you get to throw that emotional intelligence and empathy into it. That I think makes the difference. Yeah. I just love that so much. I want to push on one more thing. Sure. Why does it have to be an officer? Why can't an enlisted airman or a warrant do this? I think you could say that with pretty much anything in the Air Force, right? Like, why does rank structure exist? And I've heard some of your previous podcasts where you guys have talked about, especially with Chief, right, where you're like, hey, what if? <laughs> yeah. What if there was no rank structure? You know, how does, <laughs> how does this work? To me, it's somebody has to take responsibility, right? So I may be jumping a little bit ahead of your final question that you like to ask folks, but I think part of being an officer is you're the individual who's going to have to make a decision and the responsibility comes down to you. Right. So as much as I, I've always hated the, oh, you know, an officer is just an enlisted guy with a degree. I think the mindset is different. And I say this, you know, with the utmost respect for our enlisted troops, I've, I love working with them. They're some of the finest and smartest and most intelligent people you're going to come across. It's Absolutely. not a difference of intelligence and not even necessarily capability, but somebody is going to buy the responsibility for it. And you get paid more to buy that responsibility. Right. I mean, in its most base form. That's one of the reasons that that exists is because not everybody can be responsible. So let's limit it to the people that we have trained to take responsibility, to go out, to lead, to make decisions, to be decisive and own that responsibility. 
Yeah, it's that special trust and confidence that the Constitution places in the officers of the United States. And that is you know, extended to the Air Force officer. And in this specific context, the air battle manager who is running the battle space. They need to be the person who's not only there to make the decision, but own the consequences of those decisions for what's going on under their area of responsibility. And I mean, that's even somewhat delineated in the oaths, right, between the enlisted oath and the officer oath. The officers, they swear an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And while the enlisted troops do that as well, they also swear an oath to obey the officers appointed over them. So you're already imbuing those officers with the responsibility that is not going to fall on the head of the enlisted troop because it shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. That's why there's officers. Yeah, I love it. Love it so much. What else do people need to know about being an air battle manager, being a rated officer that's working in, you know, that is air crew, working in the battle space, working with the enlisted that we haven't yet covered that people need to know about? Man, I, so I could philosophize for ages on this because I'm a big believer in not only doing your job, but doing it well enough and working with other people that uh, like synergy, if you want to call it a buzzword, right? Like the collective whole is stronger than the individual. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things about being an air battle manager is, yeah, cool. You might be great at this little thing here, right? And no matter how good you are at your job, you're not going to go do the air war by yourself. There is a multitude of people that get involved in this in one way, shape, or form. So it really teaches how you work with other people. And I think some of the cool stuff you get to do, right? I, man, at Tinker, one year I went TDY, I think it was 11 times. I was TDY for six months and two days of that year. Wow. And I went to some pretty cool places. I went to Japan. I went to Thailand. I went to Guam. I went to Vegas. I went to Albuquerque. I went to, gosh, Malibu, California. Like, I was going all over the place, Curacao. Netherlands, Antilles, like so many cool places. And no matter where you go, you're working with different people and it's all to achieve a common goal. So yeah. one of the cool things about being an air battle manager is you learn, how do I communicate with people? Like that mm -hmm. is our job. We receive information, we disseminate it in priority order. That's what we do. But when it comes out the radio, when it goes off radio, like it should be one cool, calm, collected voice that the individual on the other end hears. Now, right. if you're watching inside the jet, it might be, you know, papers going everywhere and people screaming and pointing, but we're all working together to make that collective goal reachable. And so there's a lot of really great opportunities as an air battle manager to get to learn how to work with others, how to communicate effectively. That are a lot of really great things. And I know you like to hit on this as well, but uh, if you've read Jocko Willink's book, Extreme Ownership, I was smiling the whole time I was reading that because I was like, this is like... These are the things that you need to be a successful ABM. Yeah. Like this is, you know, you can take these principles and apply them to most places, most jobs in the Air Force, but extremely applicable in the ABM. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting when I read that book. That is a really good book. Highly recommend that members of our audience read that if they haven't already and, or go read it again. That one and then the quick follow-up with dichotomy of leadership, understanding how to balance the extreme ownership because that is also necessary to find true success. You can't go too far in one direction or another, right? Absolutely. I did want to touch on what you were asking kind of about air crew specifically. I was really surprised to learn like air crew is, it's kind of its own flavor, right? So there is a culture to it. If you are going to equate air battle management in some way, shape or form, who else are we kind of most like, who do we interface with the most? It's going to be the fighter community. Yeah. We still interface with all the heavy pilots and stuff like that but it's not really quite the same. Like our culture mirrors a lot more what the fighter culture is. There's a lot of the same terminology. We deal with the same, you know, platforms, individuals, all that stuff. So there's a lot of that culture that has bled over into the air battle manager culture. And it's great. Like it's a really fun historical, there's a lot of heritage to it in the air force. Yeah. And when you fly, like flying is inherently dangerous. So you have to really mind your P's and Q's and, and trust somebody else like with your life when it comes to, Hey, did you check that? correctly? Are you running your checklist appropriately and things like that? So it creates a lot of trust and you realize just how important it is when you work as a crew and on an airframe, man, I'll tell you what, my deployment with the E3, which was a, about a four month gig, it was when OIR was not a named operation yet. It became a named yeah. operation while I was out there. And this was 2014, 15? Correct. Yep. So when it became OIR, you know, we were flying, our short sorties were 12 hours. Yeah. And our long ones were over 16 hours. 
And when you're talking, you're on station for 12 straight hours because it's a two hour drive to get there, that wears on you. I was a one deep crew position. I was the only person on the jet that knew how to do my job. So yeah. I have to be on point for 12 straight hours. You know, we're getting refueled three different times air to air. And it was really cool to be like, hey, you know, I'm going to pour everything into this. That ends up being a 23, 24 hour day by the end of it when you're talking wake up, pre brief, post brief, debrief, like all that stuff. And man, I remember being so busy, I wouldn't have eaten if somebody hadn't gone in the back and cooked some chicken nuggets for me <laughs> in, the, in the stove in the back. So a lot of really great opportunities to kind of get to stretch yourself, learn what you're capable of, and be a part of something that's bigger than yourself, which I think you can say about a lot of stuff in the Air Force, to be honest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Every career field is going to have some aspect of that where, you know, if you truly want to, you can find ways to challenge yourself, stretch yourself, make yourself grow to become the best possible version of yourself within that career field. But it's incumbent on you to go and find those opportunities. Nobody's really going to push you to go and do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting, though, you talking about that you interfacing and kind of mirroring the fighter community. And I was wondering about this earlier, is how often is there cross-training from ABM to fighter or fighter to ABM. Have you seen much of that? I don't know that you're ever going to get a fighter pilot that becomes anything but a pilot just based on the shortage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I don't think anyone's going to want to give up flying to come be an ABM. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, when you're the person flying the jet, it's just a whole different, uh, different scenario. However, I do know, uh, I could probably name three or four off the top of my head, several buddies of mine that were ABMs for a couple of years, got picked up for a pilot and now, I, one of them flies a KC-135, one of them flies a KC-10, one of them got picked up for pointy nose, I can't remember which one, it was F-16s. So absolutely, they can cross-train. With it being critically manned, though, it is pretty tough, but they will let you go from ABM to pilot. Okay. Yeah, it's the family business, that's where we need people to go and do the thing, right? Yep. Well, very cool. All right. So I want to shift toward some of the more, you know, some of the more philosophical things that may be specific to you as Jason, as Hollywood, as an officer in the Air Force, and less about being an ABM specifically. As you've gone through your career, as you've seen all these different places, had all these different experiences, what have you personally done to develop yourself as that officer knowing that you've been given this special trust and confidence, this responsibility for making decisions, for owning those consequences, being tasked to do, in some cases, some really difficult things, how have you continued to develop yourself, prepared yourself in order to bear that responsibility? I think the first thing it comes down to is, are you capable? So you need to put all your focus and I'll be honest, like in the rated side, you're not going to be leading airmen for a long time, right? Right, A couple of years. So until you get your wings on you, you get your IQT initial qualification training, your MQT mission qualification training, all that stuff. I was a first lieutenant plus six months before I put my wings on. Now, this was years ago and I sat, you know, waiting for six months for my first flight when I got to Tinker. It's not necessarily like that anymore, but um, during that time frame, you know what I did? I studied my butt off. So <laughs> I would read all of the standards that I had as far as how do I communicate with fighters. I'm studying that thing, memorizing it inside and out, backwards, forwards, the walk around guide to my aircraft. So there are warnings, cautions, and notes associated with your aircraft. Hey, a warning is this can result in loss of life limb. So you have to memorize all of those. And I had that entire booklet literally memorized verbatim, page number, everything, because I sat there for six months waiting to fly. Right. Not everyone gets that, but if you establish that baseline capability, it gives you credibility. It makes you good at your job. It makes you desirable to have people want to work with you because you know what you're doing. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Now, I am not naturally gifted at receiving oral input and hearing something and being able to be like, oh, I've absorbed that knowledge. Yeah. I am much more a visual person. So if I read something, it sticks far less than my ears absorbing it. Problem is I wear a headset and talk on radios all day. <laughs> yeah. So I will, no joke, like I listen to podcasts and then I'll like, or I'll listen to books on Audible or something like that. And I really focus on training my capability of retaining knowledge orally. So that's basic stuff, right? You put in stuff like that. As far as the other aspect of it, I try to read the constitution, the main parts of the constitution every year, re-familiarize myself with the document that I've sworn to uphold and, and, and defend. So yeah, probably a good idea for you to know what's in it. it 
Yeah, right. I mean, at least some of the baseline stuff where people are like, that's unconstitutional. I'm like, actually, <laughs> do, you, do you know that that's not? That doesn't mean I have it memorized by any means. It's a large living document. But the baseline stuff, you know, you try to be familiar with. And then I'm a big fan of reading. I always have been throughout my life. And it's weird. You hit a certain age, and you're like, hey, I'm into professional development or personal development. Right. I want to learn how to be a better me. And so I've picked up a lot of books. I really enjoy them. I know you're a big fan, a Simon Sinek disciple. I haven't read all his books yet because I have so many books on my list, but one of my absolute favorite books is The Infinite Game. And I would say that is a life-changing book for me because it's really easy. And I'll be honest, the Air Force is built around the short term. Yeah. As an individual, you get an annual performance report, right? If you look good that year, great. Now look good for the next year. And you know, it's only going to capture certain things. It doesn't capture everything about you as an individual. Um, how you look on paper may be very different from, oh, hey, yeah, you look awesome at paper, you get results, but nobody wants to work with you because you drive everyone into the ground. That's not captured anywhere on your OPR. So I really like how Simon Sinek preaches the long game. Hey, man, play the infinite game. We're like, there's more to it than just you getting a good OPR. And the reason I like that is it divests the self-interest that we all inherently have and that you have to be fairly cognizant about in the Air Force, right? Like, you can want to be a proponent for change, but if you suck at your job, you don't get promoted, you're never going to be in a position to help affect that change. So there is a certain amount of understanding how the system works and playing within that. But I would say reading books, learning about how to improve as an individual has been a big part of my personal development as well. I actually run, I established and run the book club at the, uh, the FTU here. Okay. So I started that probably, I don't know, six months ago. So we're on our third book now which is uh, Endurance. It's about Ernest Shackleton. Really, really good book. Incredible story. Lots of leadership lessons to be learned there. But I would say those are probably the big things for me. Yeah. It's so important that people be deliberate about their development, recognizing you know, what your strengths and your weaknesses are. Good on you for understanding, hey, I'm really good at memorizing things, internalizing things from a visual standpoint, but I struggle with you know, hearing things and internalizing it from there. And then being purposeful about addressing that weakness, turning it into a strength, especially since that's you know central to what you do on a day-to-day basis, that if you aren't able to listen and retain information you know, on the radio, you're going to struggle in your job, and you're also going to make it very difficult for the other people around you. And that can very easily impact mission success and lives of those people. Yeah, and I think when you learn to recognize your own weaknesses, it not only humbles you, right, which I think is really important, not only as an officer, but as an individual in general, humility is key. Nobody wants to work with people that just think they're the greatest thing in the world and, you know, are unapproachable. So nobody likes that, but it helps you retain humility. And then you go, oh, shoot, when I do fail, which we all have and we all do, right? And I, I had one like really big time in my career where I fell on my face pretty hard. And I remember my commander like looking at me and he's like, look, man, nobody is gonna say you're a bad person because you failed the measure of your character is going to be how do you respond to that failure? Are you going to get up off your feet? Are you going to pick yourself up? Are you going to be better from it? And I really took that to heart. And man, I never wanted to feel that way again. And so, you know, it's an opportunity for self-growth. When you say, hey, you know what? I recognize I screwed this up. I have a weakness I need to work on. That's only going to make you a better person and improve the people around you and help you be humble. So, yeah, I love it. All right, we're going to wrap things up here. You know, there's obviously so much that we could talk about, so much that we've covered so far, but you know, being an ABM is critical to the Air Force mission and how we carry out our responsibility for the American people. But we got to find a point to stop somewhere, right? <laughs> yep. So I want to finish up here with the final two questions. First of all, if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn a little bit more about being an ABM, your experience being deployed, you know what it's like over in Germany or you know, at the schoolhouse or best places to live in Oklahoma City, right? <laughs> if they want to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Email is definitely the best, man, because I can track it. I can know who you are. I can respond back to you at length. So personal email and or professional email, you can throw both down in your description. Happy to provide that to people. Awesome. Yep. Contact information will be there in the show notes. Please take the opportunity to reach out to Hollywood and ask him all your questions there. All right, Hollywood, last question for you. You kind of already alluded to it. (laughs) You've been preparing for it. You know that it's coming. What does it mean to be an officer? 
I almost feel bad I kind of mentioned too much about this earlier because I was really excited to talk about it for this portion. I think it It was a dress rehearsal. Somebody, (laughs) yeah, kind of, yeah. I think it's somebody who, you know, owns that responsibility and is going to make a decision. So at its base level, like that's why you're here. That's why you are an officer. But I don't think you're a good officer unless you consider the human element, right? So yes, I can absolutely squeeze blood out of a stone and I can get results day in and day out because I'm in charge and, you know, the government has imbued me with certain authority and it's a criminal offense if you disobey me, right? As long as it's a lawful order, right? But that isn't a leader. So I think an officer and a leader, while they should be the same, are sometimes separated. Yeah. So what does it mean to be an officer? I would argue a good officer is a good leader. And a good leader is somebody who can take into account the human element, is empathetic, and does care about their people. And they set a good example in the sense that not that they're perfect, but that they are willing. And I think that's a big part of it is, hey, you know, I'm willing to do this for you. I'm willing to help you out. It's not just about me, me, me. It's about all of us together. And one of Simon Sinek's things that he said in the Infinite Infinite Games, I'm going to totally steal this from him, is he said, you know, and I'm going to put it as the officer realm, you are not responsible for the results. You are responsible for the people who are responsible for the results. Um, and that's really it at its crux, right? Like I can tell you to do X, Y, Z, but if I burn you out, then if we're looking at the infinite game, the long term here, which we need to be, yeah, I'm not doing us any favors. There's a reason why people get burned out in the Air Force, right? Because they're just getting stomped on day after day after day. And you know, you can only take so much of that. So I think if you're a good officer, you're a good leader because you care about the people and you realize that the people are the ones that make the mission happen. I love it. Major Jason Hollywood Spicer, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge, share your experience, share your philosophy about officership with us. And I encourage everybody that has listened to this podcast to you know, take what you've said to heart and recognize that difference between being an officer versus being a leader and understanding that you really should be both if you're going to put those bars on. If you're going to wear the wings of an air battle manager, absolutely. They need to follow everything that you just said. Any last things that you want to share with our audience? Just that it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for letting me push my way onto your show. I hope that I helped clarify a little bit. There's a lot to learn about being an AVM. So please hit me up if that's the case, but uh, it's been a pleasure. It's great to see you again, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Colin, the chat windows. What about them? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So when he's talking about, you know, sitting at a CRC with six computer screens with 40 or 50 different chat windows and they're all flashing yellow, unless you know what that means, you don't know what that means. So when a window is flashing, that means someone's chatted you and you have something to do. Uh-huh. And I mean, it's hard to relay, but it's kind of, imagine trying to play six video games at the same time. Okay. But, it's in real time. And by real time, I mean, if something's supposed to take two hours, it's going to take two hours. But yet when you have to make a decision, you have to make it right now. Yeah. Because the aircraft is moving at 500 knots. See, this is an interesting analogy for you to use, Reed, because you don't strike me as much of a video game player. In fact, I know that you're not really a fan of video games in general. It's just an interesting analogy for you to choose. Yeah. And... To be fair, we do own a Nintendo Switch, so I know what video games are. My <laughs> children play them. I understand. But do conceptually, you? I have been known to beat their pants off at Mario Kart. So, <laughs> right? Like, I can't. But, yeah. Okay, what so I, you're not completely incapable and therefore can use the analogy. Okay. Probably poorly, but, you know, All right, for I'm, what it's worth. But I'm on board. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So... I think what I'm trying to convey is the sense of speed and velocity of information and quantity that you have to be paying attention to across different classifications, across different geographic regions, across different priorities, all within the fleshy meat bags that are your person, right? So you have to sleep, you have to eat, you have to use the bathroom, you have to like plan out. Have you ever had to plan when you're going to pee, Colin? Actually, outside of like a road trip. (laughs) Yeah, I have to laugh because the only times that I have ever had to plan going to the bathroom, like you said, outside of a road trip, 
are all in the Air Force context. It's the only time I have to do that. Yeah, but you absolutely have to do that when you are controlling aircraft and a lot of them and it's in combat and real lives are at stake. I mean, I absolutely remember looking at a sync matrix. A sync matrix is an overlay of when ISR aircraft are going to be where doing what. It's just a visible graphic representation. And yeah, very clear memories of thinking this will be a good time right here. (laughs) Aircraft are in transit. It's kind of slow at this time of day traditionally. And you tell your peers, hey, I'm going to go at this time. They're like, oh, that's when I was going to go. You know, like you you literally have to plan this. <laughs> so it's hard to describe unless you've done it. But yeah, totally empathized, had major flashbacks to my moments staring at equal number of screens at the same time, probably. Yeah, except he was flying in OIR and right before when I was down controlling sensors. So yeah, yeah, boy, had, had a moment there for me for sure. Yeah. And something that kind of stood out to me listening to Hollywood talk about it, as well as your experience just now, is not only do you have to plan out, you know, your bodily functions and, you know, you still have to live and, you know, take care of yourself. But, you know, in a typical environment where something is so critical like that, you know, you would think, okay, well, build in redundancies, build in backups, make it so that you can go take care of those different things and you know, you've got backfill. So there's no gap in service or capability or anything like that. But as I was thinking about it, I was reminded by how dreadfully thin the bench is of the United States air force. Yes, we are very capable. And the people that we have are very good at what they do, but there's not a lot of us. And if you have to step away to go take care of something, whatever that thing is, there might be, another person who can cover for you. But I mean, there's only so many people that you can fit on an AWACS, for example. There's only so many people that you can send down range to and be deployed to the CAOC where you were. There's only so many people that are available to us. And so it's so important that every single one of us be capable and ready to step up whenever the opportunity or the need arises because that bench is so thin. Yeah. No, absolutely. And when you realize how thin the bench is, that's definitely a code brown moment (laughs) when you realize how thin it really is. And yet also at the same time, you realize how important it is to deliver. Yeah. And we've mentioned that on this podcast before, right? At some point to use a sports analogy, you're going to be in the batter's box. That pitch is going to come your way. Yep. And what are you going to do? And that is not the time to go, I should professionally develop myself. I should study. I should. No, it's too late. You got to be ready. Yeah, and absolutely. And this gets into something that I wanted to revisit a little bit. You know, I got into the importance of the technical side in last week's episode as we had talked about how technical and niche this type of capability is of controlling aircrafts. But it also got me thinking again about the conversation around being a technician versus being a leader. And yes, obviously, you know, in this particular circumstance and context about the opportunity showing up and you needing to be ready to carry out your job, you need to be capable, you need to be technically proficient. But I was wondering at the same time, is technical proficiency and capability and competence in that technical realm prerequisite to you being a leader? Or can you develop as a leader and have influence on other people and move them in the direction that they need to go at the same time as you are also developing your technical capability? And then, you know, throw it to the other extreme. Can you be a leader without being technically proficient at all? Can you be strictly focused on just the leadership aspect of it and not have to have a technical competency? Can you be purely a leader and not a technician? Or do you have to have some sort of marriage, some sort of blend between the two? What do you think, Reed? I think you do have to have a level of technical competence in order for the people who choose to follow you to give you that gift. Because if they don't have confidence that you are making the right decisions, they are not going to be willing to put their lives on the line for you. But does that competence, does that competence have to be in a technical field or can it be competence as a leader in that you are able to 
you know, catch the vision and communicate it clearly. And you can organize, train and equip them as they need to be in order to accomplish their technical mission. Or do you have to have that technical know-how of being an air battle manager, an intel officer, or a civil engineer? Do you see the difference that I'm asking here? Yeah, I do. And I think it depends on the level of leadership and the scope of responsibility. Okay. So last night was the college football national championship. So okay. apologies to all of the Ohio State Buckeyes who lost to the Alabama Crimson Tide last night. I've lived in Alabama. I'm heading to Ohio. It was a very confusing game. <laughs> who do I cheer for? I'm not really sure. And I love college football just like cocaine addicts love cocaine. Like it's bad for me, but I can't stop. Anyway, college football aside, I want you to look at Nick Saban okay. as a football coach, right? No one has any doubt about his ability as a coach. Last night, I believe he won his seventh college football championship in the modern era. He did not get that just by being good at communicating vision. He had to have vision. He had to understand it. He had to develop it. And I don't know that he's the best quarterback in the world. I don't know that he's the best defensive coordinator in the world, but he's certainly one of the best head football coaches. Again, apologies, Buckeyes. <laughs> he kind of played a good game last night. And I'll use that analogy again, right, Colin? We've talked about this before. I don't want baseball coaches leading a basketball team, but I do want a really good coach. I think they have to have enough knowledge and experience and credibility with the profession in order to be effective leaders. And I think it's that credibility and the buy-in. And I think it's a level of leadership. You know, when I look at, you know, those two and three and four star generals, you know, those joint force commanders, I need to feel like they've had some combat experience. I need to know that they understand what it feels like when you lose somebody. Yeah. I need to know that they get what I'm doing. And even if they've never been in my career field, I, I don't know. It, it's a really hard thing to try and describe, but my answer is yes. I think you need to have some technical skill. So what you're saying is that you couldn't take an amazing CEO, you know, for example, like Jack Welch of GE, you couldn't take him who doesn't have you know, significant military background. I don't know if he served in the military. I don't think he did, but you couldn't take a CEO from corporate America. Clearly, they are great leaders. They have the ability to see a vision, communicate it to an organization, and just plug them into the military context. You're saying that there has to be some technical ability within the profession of arms, whatever it might be, in order for them to lead successfully in the military space. I do. I do. And, and I'll just use this as a simple analogy. Hey, I PCS and my household goods are late. My BAH isn't right. You say that to Jack Welch, what is he going to say? What is a PCS? <laughs> okay, right. So that right there hurts his credibility because he doesn't have the competence and the skill to understand that little thing. Yeah. But to, the, to that young airman, soldier, sailor, marine, that is their whole world. They just moved and their housing allowance isn't right and all is not well in the home. As a result. Yeah. Now, if I communicated that to Jack Welch, do I have any doubt of his ability to solve that problem? No. But his ability at that moment, as a, just a rough example, right? Hypothetical yeah. to connect. That is what I struggle with. I struggle with the shared common experience, boot camp, basic training, whatever you want to call it. That shared common experience, that deference for rank and position. Those are things that I think we have to grow. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think we can just plug and play. I'm willing to be wrong. I think, you know, Secretary Carter, when he was the Secretary of Defense, talked about the force of the future, this idea of direct commission up to 06 to get certain talent and skill communities plussed up. Um, you know, these are real things that real people are talking about. And those things have happened in the past. You know, in World War II, there were direct commissions to 08, to Major General, especially for those in the manufacturing space that brought them from the automotive industry and into the military so that they could use their expertise there to help with the logistics and support side of getting the equipment to the military. And so there is precedent for that. But 
they were able to do that because there was a technical competence already in place for that specific thing. What they didn't do is take that automotive industry leader and go make them a battlefield commander. Yeah. And that's what I'm getting at, right? With um, my analogy of baseball coaches coaching basketball teams or yeah. vice versa, which, whichever I said. The, and I think that point remains. I don't want to get too fine point on it, right? Like, I'm not saying a pilot can't lead an ops group. I'm not saying that, right? They do all the time. Yeah, they do all right? the time. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. For the longest time, the senior intelligence officer in the United States Air Force was a pilot. That was RA2. Yeah. So I also don't want to get too much in the weeds, but the basic core of what it means to be a member of the profession of arms, I think that is hard, if not impossible, to replicate. And when you can't communicate with your people enough to get their buy-in, I think you can't lead. Yeah. And that gets into another thing that I think came out of Hollywood's interview is the importance of having somebody in that position of communication who is able to have that emotional intelligence and empathy for the person on the other end of the line. And we've talked about, can you automate control? Can you not? And I don't know if you can or cannot, but I think that regardless of whether we do or do not, it is going to require that emotional intelligence be in place. That if we do find a way to get AI machines and robots and all that to automate the control piece of the mission, it's going to have to be with some emotional intelligence and empathy embedded in it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Active area of research. I mean, you could write your thesis, your dissertation on this kind of thing right now, because we're right at the edge of some of this capability. And I mean, we're probably at a place where we can automate a significant portion of the data analytics, sorting through superfluous data, delivering the stuff that actually matters. We're probably at a point where we could significantly reduce the brain load for some of these folks, even ABMers. But it's that final piece, that decision and communication. That's the final piece. And that'll be a scary day when we can get to that point. People are working on it. But uh, yeah, definitely interesting times. Yeah. Again, this whole career field of being an air battle manager, being in charge of controlling the battle space is so fascinating to me and so critical to what we do in the Air Force and to the broader military as a whole. I mean, we would not be able to do what we do in projecting air power and enabling our brothers and sisters in the other services to do what they do without people like Hollywood. Yeah. One thing I wanted to bring up before we wrapped up today, Colin, is he points out a couple times how important and how central the role of communication is to his career field. Well, and I've mentioned that before. That's basically my job, right? Just to communicate. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting, especially if one considers in the theory of warfare, the three major epics, if you will, in human conflict. Basically, and there's a number of ways people have broken down the way we fight, right? Pre And the evolution. Yeah, the evolution of warfare. Basically, pre-mass production of any kind is called the agrarian age, right? And this, this was basically whatever we used to beat each other up and kill each other, we used. Technology played, you know, somewhat of an important role, but we couldn't produce it, we couldn't deliver it, we couldn't ship it with any meaningful speed. And so warfare was more driven by theory and ideas, you know, surprise, ooh, that's an idea, let's try that, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And mass, whoever had the most stuff. The next epic really started this industrialization of warfare, maybe around the 1600s when we could start to repeatedly replicate metal pieces using technology at the time. And the industrialization really peaked about the Desert Storm era. And then it was all about technology and production and machinery and equipment. Yeah. And now we are bridging into the next epic, which is the information age. And we're getting back to this idea of ideas and theories where information is most important. So it just struck me as interesting that his most important function was communication. Mm -hmm. That is the future. That is the future of warfare, to be able to gather information and then communicate it effectively. Because that is what warfare is going to be. That is where we are going to have that fight, is in the information and communication space. Yeah. And 
in communication, you have to have that emotional intelligence and empathy that we were just talking about. Otherwise, that communication will fall flat on the ears of the human who is receiving it on the other end. Exactly. And if one cannot critically analyze the information presented to them, well, then that's just a space for the enemy to manipulate. Yeah. So, yeah, really enjoyed our time with Hollywood. Really glad he was able to join us. Anything else you want to share before we wrap up this week, Colin? I just am so blown away by the officers that we get to associate with in general, in the Air Force, more specifically in these interviews. I mean, we've talked about how instructive doing this podcast has been for you and me. Getting to dive deep into each of these different career fields is incredibly rewarding. And, you know, even if we weren't getting anybody to listen to this podcast, which we are, thank you to all of you for taking the time to listen to this. It would still be incredibly beneficial to you and me, Reed. And I'm so glad that we get to associate with people like Hollywood and all the other officers that have taken the time to speak with us. It's truly an honor. And thank you all so much for being the amazing people that you are. Yeah, totally concur. And props again to Hollywood for seeking us out. You know, he reached out to us because he wanted to share and wanted to get on board. And not only is that a big affirmation of the value of what we're doing for you all, but also for us, right? We get a lot of value out of it. And that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed.